right. Welcome to our evening service. Thank you for being with us and um, Facebook friends. We love having you also. Thank you for joining us and uh, we appreciate your faithfulness uh, in watching us. So uh, turn to your hymn book. Let's stand on our feet and turn to your hymn book to page 319. Just a closer walk with thee. Page 319. Think about the word, just a closer walk with thee. Uh, been serving Christ by the grace of God for over 25 years, and I have an a all-consuming passion that I want to get closer to him. That's what I want. And the apostle Paul, who was serving Christ for over 30 years, and he was faithful, he was a spiritual giant, he was, uh, he, he, we're Mickey Mouse compared to the Apostle Paul. He was a spiritual giant of the faith. And after serving, serving Christ for 30 years, over 30 years, he said in Philippians chapter 3, I think it was verse 10, there was something burning in his heart. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Can you think about that? That's convicting. The Apostle Paul said that after 30 years serving Christ, you think about that, and you say, Paul, you already know Christ. What do you mean you want to know him? You already know him. You've been serving him faithfully and effectively for 30 years. And yet, he never arrived. And he said there's still room for growth. So Amen. praise the Lord. Think about the word. As Brother Jerry led us in this wonderful song, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Amen. Yeah. Amen.
a seat. Please be seated for our second hymn this evening, which is hymn number 97. I need thee every hour. Hymn number 97. I need thee every hour. I need Amen. Welcome to First Baptist Church. That was a rough song to get through, but we got through it. That's good. Uh, good to see my brother Steve and his son Alex. Let me give a clap for them. Good to see them here. Yeah, Steve. I'm going to help my mom take her back to Georgia. Good old Georgia. Um, all right, man, would you come forward? We'll take the offering. We'll pray first, then take the offering. Quick announcements, as usual. Soul winning, 10.30 a.m. Uh, every Saturday, double glass doors. So, um, if you're interested for that, it's good to do. I will take an uh, offering. I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for giving us this day. Lord, thank you for bringing my brother Steve here safely with Alex. And um, just help the offering, Lord, bless everyone that gives. And Lord, uh, keep us safe throughout the night and give us something from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. stand if you're able for our third hymn this evening Jesus loves me hymn number 187 please turn in your song books to hymn number 187 Jesus loves me
your Bibles at this time and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Amen. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7. We'll all read together. Verse 5, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there also are divers and vanities, but fear thou God. Thank you. you may be seated. All right. Good to see you, Stephen. See your oldest son there. Taking your mom with you, right? She needs, she needs to get away. She needs a vacation. She needs to relax. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. The title of my message tonight is, Why Do We Attend the Church? Why Do We Attend the Church? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the songs. I need thee every hour, Lord. We need you every second, every minute. Lord, without you, we can't do nothing. Without you, we're a mess. We're going nowhere, Lord. And Lord, thank you that in Christ, as saved people, we have strength. I could do all things through Christ which strengthens me, Lord. We can't make it in our own strength. We need your strength. And we have it available. We just got to tap to it, Lord. We're more than conquerors to him that love us. Thank you for the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray you just bless the word of God. We need you, Lord. We need to hear from you, not from man. Help me to be a blessing. Help me to make sense. Help me to put the emphasis where it's needed, Lord. Uh, make me a blessing. I just want to be a blessing. I need you. Lord, guide my thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. So right here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, Solomon gives a great warning about attending church. He's giving us a warning, great warning, about, about going to the house of God with the right motive about going to the house of God with the right attitude and um, we must ask ourselves why do we attend the church why do we attend the church and I believe the answer to this question varies from person to person I say that because people attend church for People attend church for different reasons. For uh, good reasons and bad reasons. And I believe that good reasons should be because you love God, you want to know him more, you want to get closer to him, and you just want to worship him, amen, and bring him honor and glory. That's the purpose what we go, that's the purpose why I go to the church house. I want to meet with God. I want to hear from God. I want to get, I want to get closer to him. I want, to, I want God to speak to my heart. I want to hear from God, the God that knows better than all of us, the smartest person in the world, God, the wisest person in the world, God, the one who created you, God, amen, the one that his ways are higher than your ways and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. That's the one I want to hear from, the perfect God, the flawless God, the one that makes no mistakes, the one that does all things well. That's the God. That's the reason why we should come. But some, some attend church because they're going through difficult moments, so they look for the solution to their problems in God. And trust me, I met a lot of people like that. When they go to church, I remember a guy years ago who was uh, 
his wife was about to dump him because he was a uh, drinking problem and he keeps telling her I'm gonna change I'm gonna change and he goes spend the money on liquor and he go ignore neglect the family neglect the wife neglect the kids and his, his wife is struggling to have food in the table and buy diapers for the kids and he just drinks it up spend his money on drinking and she gave him many chances many chances and he just they didn't change he was too stubborn finally she said I'm done with you I'm done I'm out of this marriage I'm done and I guess she met another this is an unsafe guy and then she met another guy and he called and he, he was uh, 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 crying to me and um, he, he, he started going to church. And uh, when he found out that his wife left him, he dropped out of church. He was using church as a crush to see if, uh, if, if he started going to church, he'll get his wife back. But there's people that do that. They, they, go, they go through difficult moments, so they look for the solution to their problems in God. That, that's the reason why they go to church. Some attend church because they want to fulfill a commitment with a person or a relative. Some attend church because they're religious, and they think that if they attend church, God will accept them into heaven. There's a lot of people like that. Look, going to church does not make you a Christian. Any more than climbing a tree will make you a squirrel. Or any more than entering into a garage will make you an automobile. Amen? Look, church is the, is the place for saved people. That's what the church is. You know, it's like, uh, it's like your, your, your car, right? You need to take it to the uh, mechanic, to the, car, the, the garage, to maintain the car, right? Well, here in the church house, this is like a spiritual garage for the Christian to maintain our faith. Amen? It's a spiritual hospital. It doesn't save you, but it's the place for the saved person. But some, some would do that. Some attend church looking for a spouse. There's a lot of single people in the church, especially in a large church, there's a bigger pond to fish from. Be surprised how many people like big churches, amen, because they're looking for a spouse. Some attend church because they're in charge of a class they teach, maybe a certain responsibility in the church, an usher, greeter, drive, uh, drive the church bus, and they figure, I, I, got, a, I got a responsibility, I better show up. Some attend church because they suffer from insomnia, and at least if they come to church, the bilingual Puerto Rican pastor here always put me to sleep. He never fails. This is when I take my nap in church. <laughs> and I know I'm good at that. Some don't attend at all under any circumstances because they make excuses, I'm sick, I'm busy, I work on Sundays, I got too many problems. I mean, I hear that all the time. All kinds of excuses. Why not come to church? Maybe we should have, maybe next Sunday, a promotion, no excuse Sunday. Maybe we'll fill God's house. No excuse Sundays. That will be the, the promotion for uh, maybe next Sunday or the following Sunday. That's the, that's the promotion. No excuse Sunday. And in order to make it possible for everyone to attend church next week, we are planning a special No Excuse Sunday. Cots will be placed in the church basement for those who say Sunday is my only day for sleeping in. Eye drops will be available for those who, whose eyes are tired from watching television too late on Saturday night. We will, we will have steel helmets for those who believe the roof will cave in if they show up at church. You know, I used to think that before, before Christ. I will never put my foot in the church house. I, I thought the roof would cave in. If I, that's how wicked I was and vile. Blankets will be furnished for those who complain that the church is too cold. Fans will be on the hand for those who say the church is too hot. We will have hearing aids for those members who say the speakers don't talk loud enough. There will be cotton for those who say the speakers talk too loud. Scorecards will be available for those who wish to count the hypocrites. We guarantee that some relatives will be present for those who like to go visiting on Sunday. There will be TV dinners available for those who claim they can't go to church and cook dinner too. One section of the church will have some trees and grass for those who see God in nature, especially on the golf course. The church will be decorated with both Christmas poncetas and Easter lilies to create familiar environment for those who have never seen the church without them. No, this is an uh, author unknown. I don't know. I found that. I thought uh, I'd share it. But, but look, uh, we got to go to church for the right reason, amen, for the right motive. And 
Let's look at Solomon's great warning here about attending church. Notice in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, he says, keep thy foot when thou goes to the house of God. So he's advising people to watch their steps when they go to the house of God. Watch your steps. Walk carefully when you enter to the house of God. Watch what you do at church. Give careful thought to what you're there for. Come prepare to church. Look, we prepare well our worldly. Ladies, you, do, you did your hair well. It took you a while, maybe. It looks good. I mean, we prepare well outwardly. We, we dress up with our Sunday best. But that's hourly. Why not prepare well spiritually when we come to the Lord's house? How do we prepare ourselves inwardly? How do we watch our steps when you go to the house of God? Well, as Solomon tells us, look what he says, and be more ready to hear. He says, and be more ready to hear. Go to church with attentive ears. Go to church with open ears. Go to church with the goal in mind to give God your undivided attention. Pay careful attention to the message you're going to hear. And look, eliminate all distraction and listen attentively to God's message. That's how you come to the Lord's house prepared. That's how you prepare your heart. Amen? Solomon's, as I was studying this, Solomon's is saying something similar to what James says. In James chapter 1, in verse 19. Listen to it, James chapter 1, in verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. He's talking about the context. It's about responding properly to God's word. Of course, he's talking about how to trials come to your life, and then he told you how to, when you respond properly to the word of God, then you respond properly to trials in your life too. So he's talking about the context there. He's talking about responding properly to the word of God when you hear it. So he says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. What does that mean? Be quick to listen to God's word. Be a good listener of God's word. Be an eager listener of God's word. Go to the sermon with eagerness. Hurry up and hear God's word with eagerness. That's what he means, be swift to hear. That's having the right attitude when you walked in the Lord's house. That's how you prepare your heart. That's how you go to the Lord's house and you watch your step carefully and you come with a prepared heart. That's when God is going to be at work. Amen? The word of God cannot work in our life unless we receive it the proper way. The word of God, not, I don't care what sermon you hear. You can hear the best spirit-filled sermon. It's not going to move you, touch you, change you unless you respond properly to the word of God when it's preached. That was a powerful sermon this morning. From young Sack. Man, we that's the second young person we got, I think, in a row preaching from here, and they bless us. Thank God that God got a hold of young people and God is using young people throughout the world. Amen. That's exciting. That's inspiring. That's uplifting. That's encouraging. Praise the Lord. Keep him in prayer. He's doing a great job for the Lord. But look, the word of God cannot work in our life unless we receive it in the right way. Jesus says in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, take heed while you hear. But he also said in Luke chapter 8, verse 18, take heed therefore how you hear. Not only what you hear, but how you hear. Jesus is interested in how you're going to respond to the word of God. He's interested in the, in the attitude that we have when we come to the Lord's house, especially when it's time to hear God's word. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. Jesus is in Luke chapter 8, verse 18. And I believe too many are in the tragic condition in which hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. You could be listening to me. You could be watching with your eyes, and I think you're listening, but your mind could be some, somewhere else and your heart is shut. And you will get, have no clue what the pastor preached about. That's why I had to tell my kids, I had a rule when we went to the Lord's house. Right, right when we got in the car, I said, all right, starting with you, Anthony, what did the pastor Garrett preach about? Good job, Anthony, you were paying attention. Next, Brandon, what did the pastor preach about? Good job. Then Cynthia, the oldest. And you know what? They, they, they pay attention. 
Maybe they pay attention. Maybe the wrong motive because, oh, that's going to get on us. But they did pay attention, amen? Listen, Jesus says that you could hear and not understand. So they attend, many attend church services. They hear, hear preaching but never seem to grow. The preaching doesn't change them. Is it the fall of the teacher? Is it the fall of the preacher? No, I believe it's the fall of the hearer. The fall of the hearer because it's possible for a hearer to be dull of hearing. That's what Jesus says. In, that's what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Some could be dull of hearing. They're not receptive listeners. Jesus is in Matthew chapter verse 13, uh, Matthew 13, verse 9. Who have ears to hear, let him hear. That's what Jesus says. Who have ears to hear, let him hear. So just as a servant is quick to hear his master's voice, and the mother is quick to hear her baby's smallest cry, so the believer should be quick to hear what God has to say. Amen? You might, I don't know you old people. Any old people here? Yeah, we got some over here, my in-laws. Bob, you look old too, Bob. You don't look too young. But you remember E.F. Hutton, that commercial years ago? Anybody remember that commercial? When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Old people, Brother James. Brother Jerry, you remember that? When that now, E.F. Hutton, that was E.F. Hutton. It was in the 1900s. And they became one of the most respected um, financial firms in the USA, and they were in New York. And by the way, I was looking up, you believe they still open in business? I, I was surprised, because the 1900s, uh, E.F. Hutton is a financial firm, and then uh, it was a brokerage, a financial firm. And you see in the commercial, many commercials, and you see them there in a the restaurant, they're talking, everybody's talking, there's noise everywhere, everybody's having their own conversation, and it's only, there's two guys, two business guys start talking, and they start talking about their finances, and they start taking, hey, my broker, it, it gives me good advice, my broker told me this is a good investment, and they said, he looked at the other guy, said, what does your broker say, he says, my broker is E.F. Hutton, and then, when E.F. Hutton talk, people listen, and suddenly everybody everywhere stops, and they listen, you ought to watch the commercial, but can I tell you something, when God talks, people ought to listen, Amen? When God talks, people should be swift to hear, quick to hear what God has to say. So, there's a beautiful illustration of this truth of being swift to hear, being quick to hear, or being an attentive listener. You, you don't have to turn there, but it's on 2 Samuel chapter 23, in verses 14 and 17, David King David was hiding from the Philistine. And, and the Philistine were in possession of Bethlehem. And, the, and, and there in, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, in those three verses, he was, he yearned, just yearned for a, a drink of water from a well for Bethlehem that David often visited that well while he was a youth. And he just like, he didn't even command, it, it talks about it. David's mighty man is incredible. David's mighty man, one of them, I think, killed thousands of Philistines by himself. But it was incredible. So he just yearned for a little drink of water. Like, I wish I just had a little drink of water. In fact, in, in, um, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 15, this is what he says. He simply said to himself, Oh, that one will give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now, he didn't give his mighty man order to go get him water. They just heard that yearning from him. And they moved to action. The Bible says they risked their life. They put their life in jeopardy to get that drink of water. They could have been killed. You know what? That's swift to hear. Swift to hear. In fact, uh, when they got the water, they risked their life, put their life in jeopardy just to bring that drink of water. David felt unworthy. He said this, this self-sacrifice, this water represents Tremendous self. This man risked their life for me. I'm not even worth it. This, this water is too good for me to drink. I'm just going to pour it out to the Lord in honor of those men with that self, self sacrifice that they did, that they risked their life. But you know what? They heard that. He didn't give me command. He didn't give me issue an order. They just did it swift to hear. That's what you call swift to hear. 
Man, we need to be like that when we hear God's word. Swift to hear. That's how we need to be swift to hear. You know, Zach was preaching this morning that incredible message about when Jesus stepped in the boat. You know, when, when Jesus stepped in the boat, he, uh, he uh, let me see if I remember the outline. He, he, he convicts you. Oh, anybody remember the first one? He challenged you. Thank you. He challenged you, and then he convicts you, and then he changes you. And he was talking about Peter when Peter fished all night. And the Lord told him to launch into the deep, the nets. And Peter, he probably was discouraged. I agree with what, what, what uh, Sack said. He was discouraged. He's a fisherman by trade. And yeah, Jesus says, he says, uh, launch into the deep. And he says, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. That's swift to hear, my friend. That is swift. Sack kept saying that he yielded to the word of God. We need to yield to the word of God just like Peter. And that was swift to hear when Peter did that. He yielded. That's what we need to do. We need to be swift to hear, quick to hear, and yield to the word of God, submit to the word of God when we hear it speak. Amen? That's what we need to do. Are we swift to hear God's word and yield to it? James 1.19 goes on. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Then he says slow to speak. It's surprising how much James says about our speech. He cautions us to be guarded in our conversation. He says, slow to speak. Look, we have two ears and one mouth. You notice that? You notice that? We got two ears and one mouth. Imagine if God would have made us with two mouths. Imagine what your nose is. There would be another mouth there and one big ear. <laughs> that would be the emphasis, right? If that was the case, speak more than what you listen. But for some reason, even nature tells us that we got two ears and one mouth. What does that remind us? Listen more than what you speak. Be slow to speak. Amen. Be slow to speak because many times we are quick. We make quick statements that get us in trouble. Can I get an amen? Anybody guilty of that? Where you have to apologize? Come on. Where you, we make without thinking, we make quick statements that we get in trouble. Be slow to speak. That's good advice. Amen. It'll save you a lot of trouble. Many times we say, oops, I should have never said that. He says, and then he goes on, James 1.19, slow to wrath. Again, the context is responding properly to the word of God. Slow to wrath. Be slow of getting, getting angry at God's word when you hear it. I think that's why he's talking about slow to wrath. Be slow in getting angry at God's word when you hear it. Be slow at resisting God's word with hostility, with anger, when the truth confront you and convicts you. Thank God for conviction. I like that. I like, I like, a message to my mind about, you know, what, what Sack was talking about. Because the last one was after he convicts you, first he challenges you, then he convicts you, then he changes you. That's the whole purpose of the challenge of the sermon. That's the whole purpose of the conviction. Now you got to do something about it and change your behavior, change your action. Amen? That's the whole purpose. But many times we stop on the challenge and the conviction and we don't change. We get moved, we get stirred, but we don't make the necessary changes. And many times we need to be slow at resisting God's word with hostility, with anger when the truth confronts you and convicts you. Then he goes on in James chapter 1 in verse 20, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So when you get angry at the conviction of God's truth, then the word of God is not going to do the work in which it is to produce the righteousness of God in you. That's the whole purpose of the conviction and the challenge is to produce the righteousness of God in you, to make you right with God. To make me right with God. So this cannot happen if you're not a good listener, if you're not swift to hear, if you don't respond properly to the conviction and the challenge of the word of God, and instead you get angry. And then you get angry at the preacher. I have people got angry at me. I, I won't mention any name, but one time years ago I was preaching here, and I forgot what I was preaching, and a listener right there got mad at me. He said, who do you think you are to preach, to preach that? I said, the Holy Spirit gave me that. And man, he got mad at me. I said, take it with the Holy Spirit if he convict you. I didn't mention no name. 
But the Holy Spirit is the one that mentioned your name, not me. Amen? Hey, I'm just a paper boy. That's like me delivering the newspaper, and I give you the newspaper, and you don't like what's written in the front page, you get mad at me. I'm just a paper boy, the, message, the messenger. Look, there's many times that I got angry at Pastor Garrett's preaching when I first got saved. There's many times that I, I, I got, I said, man, it's like, that's wrong too. It's like everything I do is wrong. I just got right with one area that he preached on, and now the next week, I, that's wrong too? I'm like, everything I do is wrong. And there's times that he got under my skin, and I got mad. Anybody like that? I got mad. And one, I said, I'm not going back to the church. I'm glad. I'm glad I came back, and man, I'm glad I stayed. Because I needed a hard preaching. I needed that hard hitting preaching because I don't know about you, but I'm a very stubborn guy. And I need, I need a Nathan like Pastor Gary who look at me and put, put his, his skinny finger and say, Thou art that man. Thou art that man. Amen? And I needed that a soft preaching. Ain't going to do nothing for me. I needed that hard preaching. And that's what kept me right with God. I'm glad I didn't get angry and left the church. I would have been a mess. So look. And that's what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 12 when Nathan the prophet told King David, thou art the man. You know, you took that, 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 that woman that didn't belong to you. You stole that, 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 that woman. You stole that, that married man, uh, woman. And, uh, and David got on the conviction. And he said, I have sinned. He responded properly. He responded properly. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. It says, keep thy foot, which means watch your step. When thou goes to the house of God, watch your step. When you go to the house of God, work carefully. When you enter to the house of God, come prepared to church. How do you do that? You be more ready to hear. Come to church with open ears. Come to church with attentive ear. Ask the Lord to speak to your heart with the message. Ask the Lord to deal with you with the message. That's a good way to start. Amen? We should, we should be prepared because God wants to speak to us. And we ought to come to the Lord's house with a goal in mind. Lord, change my life through your word. That should be our goal. Change my life, dear God, through your word. And he will change your life through, your, through his word. If we respond properly. You know, uh, what is it? Uh, is it 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13? I'm just throwing it out. Where, where, where he's talking about the church of Thessalonica. That was, I believe, one of the strongest churches that the apostle Paul built, founded, I believe. He started many churches, but I believe that's one of the strong, thriving church. And they were already saved for less, for, uh, 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 less than a month. And, um, and I think it's First Thessalonians, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing it, where he says that they said that they heard the word of God preached, not at the word of man, but at the word, the, the, the word indeed, truth. You know, they didn't, they, didn't they, didn't they didn't see that word. That's not the word of man be preached, but in truth, the word of God. And it effectually worked in them. I, I'm paraphrasing it. But they, they, when they heard the word, they were swift to hear. They respond properly. They believe God is speaking to that man, to me. And I want God to change me through his word. And they were changed. They were transformed because the Bible said they turned from idols to serve the living God. And they were example to all those around them. All, all around them. They were examples to those who not chaos. And they spread the word everywhere. It was an incredible transformation. Why? Because they took God's word very serious. They respond to God's word very serious. And that's what we need to do when we come to church. Come to church with open ears, with attentive ears. Ask the Lord to speak to your heart to the message. Lord, change my life through your word. Why? It says, be more ready to hear, Solomon say. Why should we pay Careful attention to the message you're going to hear. Why? Well, let me just show you. Go to Psalm 19 for a minute. Go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. I want you to look at this. Why we must pay careful attention to the message you're going to hear every Sunday here, every Wednesday night. Well, God wants to change your life. God wants to work in your heart and my life through his word. And in Psalm 19, I want you to notice there in verse 7 through 11, Psalm 19, 
Look at verse 7 there. It says, the Lord of the Lord is what? Perfect, flawless. Amen? This is a perfect book. Converting what? This word has transforming power. Converting the soul from inside out. And then it says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Make ye wise. It will make you wise. God's word will make a foolish person into a wise person. It will make a person who's making a mess out of his life with foolish decisions to start making wise decisions and start living the abundant life and be blessed by God. It will make you wise. It will convert your soul, God's word. It, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing. It will bring true joy to your heart, God's word. And then it says the commandment of the Lord is pure and enlightens the eyes. And then he says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Watch this. More to be desired are they than gold, yen, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. And then he says, moreover by then, this is the word of God. The pure word of God is sweeter than honeycomb. Uh, it says, more for by them is thy servant warned. The word of God will bring conviction. It will bring correction. It will warn you about going the wrong path. And it will encourage you. It will, it will exhort you to choose the right path. Amen? It says, moreover by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, that's obedience, obey what you hear, there is a great war, reward. That's what is important for you and I to place careful attention to the message we're going to hear because you're going to be blessed in a mighty special way. It brings great reward when we obey what we hear. Amen? So he goes back, uh, Solomon, Ecclesiastes 5.1, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools for they consider not that they do evil. So you could come to church with the right attitude, ready to hear. Or you could come to church with the wrong attitude, giving the sacrifice of fools. That's the wrong attitude. The right attitude is come uh, ready to hear. I mean, a, 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 attentive listening. What is the sacrifice of fools? This is the wrong attitude to come to church. What is the sacrifice? Well, a good example of the sacrifice of fools is Saul was known for his incomplete obedience. Saul, remember? For his partial obedience. Remember the famous passage of 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22? To obey is better than sacrifice. Remember that story? Where God told him, go kill all the Amalekites. I'm fed up with them. I, 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 the way they're treating my people, I'm going to punish them. And he told them, gave them an order, so kill them all. Utterly destroy them all. Don't leave nobody alive. Kill everybody, every animal, everybody. I'm fed up with them. They're vile people. They're wicked. And I'm going to wipe them out. That was the order that God gave. And he went and got his army men all and killed a lot. It was a big slaughter. But guess what? He didn't kill everybody. He left the king alive. King Ahab, he left them alive. And then he killed a lot of animals, but he left, he killed the animals that were vile and the ones that were sick and the very fat and healthy ones. Keep them alive. Don't kill those. Keep the healthy ones alive. The real ones that are sick and vile and, 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 and blind, kill all of them, but keep the healthy one alive because we're going to make a big sacrifice to the Lord to thank him for his victory. And all of a sudden, Samuel showed up, and that's when Samuel said to obey is better than sacrifice. Amen? That's incomplete obedience. Samuel told him he pretty much justified his own failure, saw his own disobedience. And then he says, he got the, the audacity to say after he disobeyed, he said, I, 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 uh, he said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Liar. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He told Samuel that. And then Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 14, Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen when I hear? In other words, what is this sound of the sheep of the cattle that I hear? What is this? <laughs> what is that noise? And then he tried to justify. He's trying to justify. No, 
Uh, Samuel said, hey, to obey is better than sacrifice. So I believe the sacrifice that God wants is our complete obedience. A sacrifice of fools is incomplete obedience. Saul is an example of that. God wants complete obedience, not partial obedience. Look, this is not a buffet. You ever, I love buffets. I love the China buffet. By the way, Pastor Gary used to eat. I, that guy could eat. I don't know how he did it, but he could eat. Nobody could com nobody compete with him, him and Brother Louis too. Those guys are, they could eat. I, I, Pastor Gary used to love China buffet. And we ate him China buffet many times, and he'll grab like six rounds. I don't know how he does it. I go for like the first big rounds, and I fill it up real good. I'm stuffed. And then I take a little dessert. Well, Pastor Gary is like in his fourth, fifth round. And he got about a six round and then come in the dessert. And the dessert is about a two or three more rounds. I don't know how he did it. And he stayed so slim. It was amazing. It was, and he didn't talk. No conversation. Let me eat. <laughs> but look, what am I saying? It's okay in the buffet, pick and choose. Not God's word. We've got to obey all the commandments. Because Saul was trying to do that. And, 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 and Samuel rebuked them. To obey is better than sacrifice. Because I believe the sacrifice that God wants is our complete obedience. So the sacrifice of fools is to listen to God's clear commandments and not take them seriously. The sacrifice of fools is to listen to God's truth and not change. The sacrifice of fools is to, take, to not take seriously your relationship, your relationship with God. Sacrifice of fools is superficial worship. That's sacrifice of food. Coming to church will never be because I'm trying to fulfill an obligation. I'm trying to, 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 to punch in and put in my time. I'm trying just to put in my offering envelope. When you do that, you're not watching your step. You're not walking carefully when you enter to the Lord's house. You come in with the wrong motive, the wrong attitude. And don't expect God to work in your heart. You're not coming to church to prepare to meet your God. You're giving God a sacrifice of fools. That's, that's having the wrong attitude and coming to the Lord's house. We must come to church because we want to eagerly hear the word of God. We're more ready to hear. And most important of all, because we want to obey and live according to the word of God. We want to strengthen our relationship with Christ. That's what we want. Don't pick and choose which commands you're going to obey. Don't redefine God's clear commands. Don't rewrite God's command. Don't tamper with God's word. You do that when you disobey them and, and, and when you do what it feels good or what it seems best. For you rather, uh, 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 look, he says here, I believe the, what the sacrifice that God wants is complete obedience to the word of God. Anything shorter than that, is, I believe, is a sacrifice of fools. Look at verse 1 there, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, the last phrase there. For they consider not that they do evil. For they consider not that they do evil. Just like Saul. Saul is a good example. He was oblivious to his own foolishness, lacking self-awareness. He justified his own disobedience. He says, I performed the commandment of the Lord in 1 Samuel 15, 13. He didn't consider that what he was doing was wrong. It was evil. It was uncomfortable. Incomplete obedience. I think I think Samuel rebuked him and said, "You know, your disobedience is like the sin of witchcraft. It's rebellion. That's pretty strong language." But he didn't he didn't realize that. He he didn't consider that what he was doing was evil. Until you and I admit that we're living in disobedience, until we admit that we're not right with God, and we're doing evil. You will never change into the person God wants you to be. I will never change into the person that God wants me to be. The Bible talks about in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9, fools make mock of sin. You're a fool when you take sin lightly, when you want to play and toy with sin and expect to get by with it. That's a fool. When God points sin in your life, you ought to get on the conviction, admit you did wrong, and just like uh, Nathan, when he rebuked David, thou art a man, I have sinned, I'm guilty as charged. 
Look at verse Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. He says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. So be careful in opening our mouth. Many times we make quick statements, not pleasing to God. Again, I should have never said that. But I believe the context here is of, if, of making a promise to God and not following through. That's the context here. Solomon's warning, do not make any decision under the stress of emotion. Many decisions are done in the emotion of the moment. We should never make any commitment to the Lord under the stress of emotion. In other words, be sincere with your commitment to God. Be sincere with your decision to God. Don't sign a pledge if you're not sincere. You know, if you're going to sign a pledge of faith promise, because, hey, that's a good thing to do, amen? We've got to support those missionaries. We don't want to drop any mission. We want to add missionaries. It's a sad thing when we got to call a missionary and say we can't afford anymore because the finances are not coming in. It happened to me when I was getting support, when I had churches supporting me, when they had to call me and say, look, uh, people are not giving, and uh, we don't have it come in, so we're going to have to drop you. I had a job. I was fine. I work a full-time job, but there's a lot of those missionaries that are depending on that to survive because that, that's how God supply their needs. They're full-time for the Lord. But look, I, I, I done it. I, I have made pledges. I, I told God. I remember one time I told the Lord, I, I'm going to give $110 a week in faith promise for a year. I thought it through. I'm not saying that I make that fast. I pray about it, and God, and God, and I believe God was in it, and I fulfilled my whole commitment for the whole year. I didn't make a lot of money, but I, I, I did that, and I was sincere, and I kept through it. And look, I, I, I made many, uh, many decisions to God, many commitments. I told God when God was moving in my heart, when I, when God was calling me, and and God called me to preach, and I told God I would go to a Bible college. I made that commitment. I go to you. You provide Bible. I will go to the Bible college. And I told you, Pastor Garrett, when I came down from Pastor Ku, I said I surrendered to preach. Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Give me a hug. He was excited. And then I said, Now I need a Bible college. Can you recommend one? And then he told me. And you know what? I I, I went through my commitment. I went for six years in Bible college, and I kept my commitment to the teeth, because I made that commitment to God. It's serious when it comes to God, amen? He takes me very serious, so I take him very serious. I even told God. I was starting, a, a preacher was preaching, God moved in my heart about, about planting churches, and I was scared of death, I was terrified. And I told God, Lord, I, I don't have what it takes, Lord, I'm not educated. Lord, I feel inadequate, but if you could use a nobody like me, here am I, send me. And you know what, I surrendered, I said, I will start a church in the next 10 years. And I waited 12 years. And the Holy Spirit was speaking to my heart. Whoa, you're two years late. And I couldn't get it off my mind. Stephen, it got, it, 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 the, the voice got louder. And every time I hear a man preach, he says, I want you to do that. I want you to start a church. When you start in that church. Anybody know Phil Rizzo? He was trying to run for governor. Thank you, Phil Rizzo. He's the one that encouraged me. He invited me to the church planning conference, and that's when, that's when the, I, I, I started making excuses, and I submitted to the word of God, and I yield, and I told God, I'm going to start it this year. And I started Christ Center Baptist Church in Plainfield, New Jersey. We got it started, amen? We got it started, and God let me hear from there. Why? Because I made a commitment to God. And I took it very serious. Be sincere when you make a bow to God, a commitment to God. Look at verse 4, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. When thou bowest about unto God, defer not to pay it. For he that hath no pleasure in fools, pay that which thou hast bowed. Verse 5, better is he that should not bow, from that thou should not, but thou shouldest bow and pay. If you're not serious about your commitment to God, don't do it. It will do more damage than good. Look, it's good to make decisions to God, but take them serious. I made many decisions for God, but I take them very serious. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, a very familiar verse. You, find, you probably find this uh, verse a lot in the, in the Jesus bookstore where they sell Christian stuff. Choose ye the day who you will serve. 
But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's a good decision to make. I'm glad that I, I made that decision back in 1994 when I came for the first time in this church. When I say I, uh, I made a decision that I'm going to choose to serve Christ. Best decision I made in my life. And I took that decision very serious, and I take it very serious every day. Amen? Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, he says, How long will you halt or will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. That's a good decision. Choose to follow the real living God. The God that answers by fire. That's the real God. Follow him wholeheartedly. That's a good decision. And we ought to take it serious. Amen? We ought to take it. Look, in Matthew 16, verse 15, Jesus is calling for a decision. Whom do they say that I am? John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah. And then he said, whom do say ye, ye that I am? I want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from, from you. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen? Be sincere when you make decisions to God. If you're thinking about trusting Christ as Savior, make sure it's not an emotional high. Make sure you understand first that you are a sinner. I need a Savior. I'm done with this life. I'm going to give my heart to Him. Do it because you mean business. Don't do it at the emotion of the moment. Because too many people do it at the emotion of the moment, and it's like shallow professions of faith. Shallow. Many makes heart rash bows at wedding altars at the emotion of the moment without understanding the meaning of the bow. Can I tell you, until death do us part. I got to promote that. You know why I got to promote that? Because their divorce rate is high in, among Christians. And it's until death do us part. That's a bow, amen? We got to keep our word. Come on now. I'm talking to the married people. Stay married. Be love bird like Brother George and Susie, they've been married for 100 years now. And not long ago, it was their anniversary. And Brother George was praising the Lord for the godly wife that God gave him because she keeps him right with God. Come on, Brother George. Right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I agree with you. She is a godly wife. May God bless their marriage. Amen? How about a decision... You know, I mean, we got to take decisions serious for the Lord. I mean, we got to take church, going to church serious. Attending church serious, my friend. Prayer, Bible reading, soul winning. Just the Lord's word. Let's take it very serious. The greatest business in the world. There's no greater business than serving the Lord. Look what he says in verse 3. For a dream coming through the multitude of business and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. So Solomon is so accurate how dreams come through the multitude of business. You know, research study tell us why we dream. What causes specific dreams? How? Multitude of business. Every day things like moving to a new place, changing jobs in the midst of a lot of business, running around, running there. Anxiety, stress builds in. The mind is spinning. The mind is stressful. During the running around, a phone call, losing a loved one, a divorce letter. You go to sleep stressful. And you know what? Don't be surprised if a wild, stressful dream will follow. Some crazy dreams I have. I don't put my faith in dreams. I put my faith in the word of God. And then when I wake up, Lord, thank you. It was only a dream. <laughs> you ever been there? Thank you, Lord. It was only a dream. So look. Listen, you go to sleep hungry, you might dream of a buffet. <laughs> Look, the crazy things which happen in dreams by a busy, stressful mind. So are fools with their mouth out of the stress of the moment. They make bad decisions, they speak too fast. They decide too fast without giving a serious thought. Look at verse 6, suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. So don't let your mouth lead you into sin by your shallow bows, your shallow commitments. Neither say thou before the angel, that angel could be referring to God's messenger or the priest, that it was an arrow. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? So Solomon is giving advice regarding foolish use of our mouth. 
When one makes a promise to God after making a commitment to God, we're not to say it was a mistake. I didn't mean it. I was under stress. We're messing with a God who is holy and very serious about our worship to him. Amen? Don't try to excuse yourself before God's messenger and say, I really didn't mean it. Hey, let us not play games with God. Amen? Let us not play with God. God is very displeased by our insincerity of, of speech. You don't want God to be displeased with your lack of commitment because he's not going to bless the work of your hand. You become a failure. You're going to become non-productive for the Lord. I don't want about you, but I want to be productive for Jesus Christ. I want to bear much fruit and much fruit and much fruit and much fruit and much fruit that remains. That's what I want. How about you? I want to be fruitful for Christ. I want to be productive. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to have indifference in my life. I don't want to have a callous heart. I want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. That's what I want in verse 7. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diver vanities, but fear thou God. Our many sincerity of words and are unreliable and empty like many dreams. You know, in Jeremiah, let me just finish. Go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah. <clears throat> in Jeremiah chapter 23, notice verse 25 there. Jeremiah chapter 23. In verse 25, he says, I have heard what the prophets say that, prof that prophesy lies. Lies in my name, saying, I have dream, I have dream. How long should this be in the heart of the prophet that prophets are lies? Yeah, they, they, yeah, they are prophets of the seed of their own heart. So Jeremiah here tells us about some, some pretended to know the mind of the Lord by dreams. We got a lot of people like that out there. Listen, don't put your faith on dreams. They're not reliable. I believe God speaks through his word today. Amen. We have the complete word of God right here in the King James Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The canon of scriptures is closed. That's why in the last book of Revelation, God says, don't take away, don't add to it. Leave it alone. Don't tamper with it. God speaks through his word. For many trust dreams more than God's word. You must test your dreams and mystical experience with God's word. You don't test everything by God's word, you're going to be misled. The best way it is, he said, fear God is the best way. Fear God, he says, but fear thou God. Fear God is the best way. To fear God is to reverence God, to respect God, to obey him, to take him at his word, to take him serious, man. That's what we need to do. Take God at his word. When God challenges you, when God convicts you, and if you take God at his word and you fear God and keep his commandment, God will change your life. That's what God wants. I believe when we fear God, it will impact the way we live, the way we come to church. Why do we attend church? Solomon says, keep thy foot when thou goes to the house of God. Watch your steps. Walk carefully. Come to church prepared, ready to hear. Be serious about your commitment towards him. That's the whole summary of it. Be Serious about your commitment to the Lord. That's what we need to do. God is very serious about saving you and changing you, about giving you real meaning of life. Are you serious tonight to respond to his call? Let's be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand on our feet. As the music play, Lord, move in your heart. The invitation is open for those who want to respond to the message.